Okay, then let's talk about violence, and in particular, Lenin's attempt to implement Marxism in practice through the Russian Revolution. Before we get to Lenin himself, I want to talk a little bit about violence itself. World War I involved violence on an unprecedented scale. The last major European war before this had been the war between France and Germany in 1870. That was already more than a generation in the past, and by 20th century standards, it was actually a very minor conflict. Of course, the American Civil War was an immensely bloody conflict, but still World War I dwarfed it. This was violence on a scale that no one had ever seen, and really that had not existed maybe ever before in wartime. It led in some quarters to a fascination with violence, and in fact, leading up to it was a kind of fascination with violence. Last time I treated the war as if it was simply, uh, in effect, an accidental result of a series of misreactions to an event that, while serious, the assassination of an archduke, was nevertheless not the kind of thing you would have expected to lead to a major world war. But there was a kind of fascination even before the war. Roy will talk more in his next art lecture about this movement. But there was a movement known as Futurism. The originator of it was Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, um, who wrote the Manifesto of Futurism in 1909. It was a movement that rejected the past, looked forward to the future with excitement, was inspired by technology, glorified novelty, danger, violence, and speed. And it's in some ways a remarkable movement. You look at the art people produced, and much of it is very impressive. On the other hand, if you look at the ideology as Marinetti and others express it, it's insane. <laughs> and so there is this element that helps to lead to World War I, that helps to lead to what occurs in the Russian Revolution and various movements thereafter. Here is <laughs> a description he gives introducing the movement. Come, my friends, I said, let us go. At last, mythology and the mystic cult of the ideal have been left behind. We are going to be present at the birth of the centaur, and we shall soon see the first angels fly. We must break down the gates of life to test the bolts and the padlocks. Let us go. Here is the very first sunrise on Earth. Nothing equals the splendor of its red sword, which strikes for the first time in our millennial darkness. Now, he's writing this in 1909, basically saying, we're at the birth of a new world, and it's exciting. We're going to see angels fly. But notice the red sword. All of this is going to happen through the violent destruction of what's gone before. In 1903, we saw Shaw being cynical, basically saying all these values, this entire civilization is pretty worthless. There could be no greater criminal than somebody who would recreate the London of today. And here we see people saying, in effect, yeah, strike it down. In fact, let's don't just make <laughs> sort of humorous plays about this. Let's actually use violence. Now, did these people use violence? Well, no. They painted paintings. <laughs> they wrote stories. <laughs> um, their red sword was a paintbrush. And so they didn't themselves do much. But it indicates something about an attitude that was inspiring a lot of people in various countries in Europe in the first couple of decades of the century. And we hunted like young lions, death with its black fur dappled with pale crosses. There's an important passage in Nietzsche where he talks about a lion going over the plain, this blonde beast in search of prey, and he glorifies the strength and the violence of the lion. Well, these people are inspired in part by that and saying, yes, we hunted like young lions, death with its black fur dappled with pale crosses, who ran before us in the vast violet sky, palpable and living. So here they are as predators, and they're glorifying this, the ideology of the predator. Okay, the lion, the cat, seeking the mouse, and so on. Now, death tamed went in front of me at each corner, offering me his hand nicely, and sometimes lay on the ground with the noise of creaking jaws, giving me velvet glances from the bottom of puddles. You can see some of the art that goes along with this, dramatically different from art that had gone before. There's an interest in the absurd, something which becomes a major theme in 20th century literature and philosophy, and really appears here in a certain sense explicitly for the first time. Let us leave good sense behind like a hideous husk. A good sense behind like a hideous husk. Okay, and let us hurl ourselves like fruit spiced with pride into the immense mouth and breast of the world. Let us feed the unknown, not from despair, but simply to enrich the unfathomable res reservoirs of the absurd. So the value here becomes the absurd. Good sense? Ha! Fooey on good sense. That's the shackles of the past. That is something that is a hideous husk we want to cast away. Let's don't be sensible. Let's don't be reasonable. Let's cut through to embrace the absurd, embrace the unreasonable, embrace the irrational. Now, all of this 
<laughs> well, sounds kind of irrational, but they glorify in that. We want to sing the love of danger, the habit of energy and rashness. The essential elements of our poetry will be courage, audacity, and revolt. Those are themes we'll see again and again throughout the 20th century also. Revolt, freedom, passion, as Camus will later put it. And aggression. Literature has up to now magnified pensive immobility. Think about the 19th century novel. And I love the 19th century novel, by the way, but most of what you read as novels in high schools are 19th century novels. You read who? Well, Fitzgerald's 20th century. We'll get to him. <laughs> but yes, you read him. But before you, know, you get to the American literature, you might read Thomas Hardy or um, Jane Austen. And what do people do in Jane Austen novels? I want to love Jane Austen. I've tried to read her novels because I think of her as in some broad sense of kindred spirit. But what happens in a Jane Austen novel? People sit around and talk. And then they go into another room and they sit around and talk. And then I don't know what happens after page 150 because I've never had the patience to continue to that. But that's the kind of literature these people are rebelling against. They're saying, ah, yes, it's magnified pensive immobility. People just sitting around talking, thinking, oh, yeah. Ex ecstasy and slumber. We want to exalt movements of aggression, feverish sleeplessness, the double marks, the perilous leap, the slap, and the blow with the fist. So that's what's going to happen in our literature. None of this, well, how are you doing, Mr. Darcy? Oh, God. <laughs> it's not going to be like that, all right? It's going to be the blow with the fist. In our literature, people are going to come up and say, hey, how's it going? Bow! Okay. <laughs> that's what it's going to be like. And so this is going to be about aggression, sleeplessness, fury, energy. Now, Beauty exists, Marinetti says, only in struggle. By the way, this is an awesome <laughs> image. I really like that. What that has to do with violence, I don't know, but, but notice the movement. There is no masterpiece that has not an aggressive character. Poetry must be a violent assault on the forces of the unknown to force them to bow before man. So once again, the image of the lion. You must be master. At one point, Nietzsche talks about and glorifies master morality as opposed to slave morality. In fact, in many ways, his critique of Christianity comes down to the thought that it glorifies weakness. It's the morality of slaves. He says, no, I want to preach the morality of masters, the morality of aggression, of being a predator, of... <laughs> okay? And that's what they want to do too, right? Po their poetry is going to be a violent assault. You will read the poem and go... <laughs> okay, that's what they're striving for. They also want to glorify war. Okay, within five years they get their wish. <laughs> the only cure for the world, militarism, patriotism, the destructive gesture of the anarchists, the beautiful ideas which kill, and contempt for woman. <laughs> now, <laughs> why contempt for woman? I mean, they want war, they want fighting, they want aggression, got it. But then, contempt for woman, what's that about? Is that like women are seen as more peaceful? I guess that's the idea. What do women contribute to the social order? Well, many things, but among them, a certain peacefulness, right? How many women are violent criminals? Some, but relatively few compared to men, right? And so they're glorifying not only the morality of the master, but the morality of men and aggressiveness and so on, as opposed to the morality of women, which they see as, let's get along, let's get along, we can work this out. Whereas the guy is more like, Oh, I kill you, man! <laughs> okay? <laughs> and they're glorifying the I kill you, man! As opposed to the, it's okay, we can work it out. <laughs> um, now, it's interesting, I think, that they identify that with gender roles, but they do, and so contempt for woman is part of the package here. We want, it's not just contempt for woman, though. It's contempt for civilization. In fact, at one point, Orson Welles says, look, if it weren't for women, we'd all be sitting around in caves eating raw meat. We made civilization to impress our girlfriends. <laughs> and, and I think they share that attitude, okay? Um, they say, look, we want to demolish museums and libraries, fight morality, feminism, and all opportunist and utilitarian cowardice. So notice the enemies here. Museums, libraries, anything that records the wisdom of the path, Fu the past, sorry, phooey on the past. Fight morality. You tell me what I ought to do and what I shouldn't do, forget it. I'll do what I want. Feminism, you're going to glorify feminine virtues as opposed to masculine aggression, fighting, no. Opportunist and utilitarian cowardice. The utilitarian says, here's what you ought to do, act for the best, produce as much happiness as possible. They're saying, screw happiness, <laughs> okay? Fight, fight. Well, all too soon they would get their wish. 
But I think it's important to look at this movement. There weren't a lot of people in it. Nevertheless, it's expressing an attitude that some people had. It wasn't just Shaw's cynicism about the past or Nietzsche's loss of faith in progress and loss of faith in the past. It's really a kind of hostility, saying, I'm tired of civilization. Forget civilization. I want to cast off the bounds of civilization and do something else. That gets expressed in the First World War. It gets expressed in the Russian Revolution. It will get expressed dramatically and quite self-consciously in the ideology of the Nazis, who share a distinction between culture and civilization, seeing civilization as oppressive and culture as somehow expressing our true natures. In fact, in many ways, we'll find the same sort of distinction in Freud. Let's look at Lenin and what he actually does in Russia. He was a revolutionary for a long time. And the Germans are the ones who actually put him in power in Russia. They sent him on a train to Russia during the war in April of 1917 to try to take over Russia and get Russia out of the war. At a certain point, he was in hiding in Switzerland, and they arranged passage for him to get to Russia through Germany, basically saying, go, <laughs> take over, depose the Tsar, so we no longer have to fight on the Eastern Front. Well, that worked. He was the first of a new species, historian Paul Johnson has said, a professional organizer of totalitarian politics. What does that mean, a professional organizer of totalitarian politics? Say it again. Well, he becomes a tyrant, that's for sure. But, yes. He was the first to start communism. Well, he doesn't start communism, but he's the first to put it into practice anywhere. So that's certainly true. Um, up until, remember the Communist Manifesto was 1848, it's now 1917, so it's been, what, 60 years roughly, and has any country become communist during that 60 year period? No. The anticipated revolution of the proletariat has not occurred anywhere, and Lenin's job is to bring it about. Now notice he is a professional organizer, this is his job, this is what he does. He isn't a guy who is an eyeglass maker, let's say, and does this on the side, no, this is what he does. He, his goal is to try to take over and bring about the Marxist revolution. Yeah? It seems to be, when they say a first of the new species, uh, the first that is, is capable of manipulating government and manipulating, it seems like, political fractions within the government to get what he wants. Manipulating government to get what you want. Well, he does more than manipulate the Russian government. <laughs> he destroys it. Uh, so at first, in the early stages, you're right. To manipulate, to, to sort of build this secret organization um, an organization that appears to be one thing on the outside, but is something quite different in reality, to manipulate, to do all that, until you get to a certain point where you actually can bring about the revolution. And then it's not just a question of taking small steps and saying, hey, we want this, we want that. It's really an outright replacement of the government. But in the early stages, you're absolutely right. It's <coughs> going to look like a manipulation, and the real aims are kept secret. Yeah. So he was the first like self-appointed ruler or dictator of the modern world. The first self-appointed dictator. Um, in a way, that is true. Because after all, he was, he was a nobody, right? It's not like he was the prince who was going to do to take over from the king or anything like that. This was somebody who sought the power of uh, a king, really beyond that. Somebody who wanted to concentrate all power in himself and did that. He becomes a professional politician in a way, but notice without any office, without any pay, and so on. How did, who, who was paying for this? Um, it's a good question. <laughs> but at some point, he's living just by full-time trying to foment revolution. And early in the century, he publishes a book, <clears throat> What is to be Done? The title page originally here. So here is before the revolution. Find Lenin. I go, where's Waldo? <laughs> where's Vladimir? <laughs> he's over on the left. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so there he is, just, you know, happily along a parade route, like, hey, I'm not doing anything, guys, I'm just here. <laughs> but it didn't take long. <laughs> here he is, young, okay, as a young revolutionary, planning throughout a Marxist revolution. He claims to be an orthodox Marxist. He says, from the philosophy of Marxism, cast as from one piece of steel, it's impossible to expunge a single basic premise, a single essential part, without deviating from objective truth. So he's saying, look, Marxism is completely right. You can't deny a single thing in Marxism. Uh, Orthodox Marxism requires no revision of any kind. I like to put these on the midterm exam, and inevitably somebody will say, Marx said it. <laughs> but no, Marx doesn't talk about Marxism. Um, Lenin talks about Marxism. 
And he claims that he's an utterly orthodox Marxist. But actually, it's not true. He introduces a, no a couple of non-Marxist elements. Why? Well, the puzzle had been, all right, it's been about 60 years since the Communist Manifesto. Why is it that the revolution hasn't occurred? Think about conditions in 1848. They were quite bleak. Tremendous inequality. The life of the working class in the cities was terrible. They were working very long hours in very unsafe conditions for very little pay. And yet, by the turn of the century, and then by the second decade of the 20th century, still the revolution has not occurred. Why not? It was something that puzzled Marxist thinkers. This was supposed to have happened long ago, and it still hadn't happened. Now, how could you explain that? You're a Marxist thinker, let's say. You're thinking, well, Marx predicted the revolution. It hasn't come about. Why? Yeah? It's the intellectuals with the ideas, and the lower class who would be the fighting force. They aren't exposed to everything like that, necessarily. Ah, good. So you're thinking about the average worker, right? This person's going to foment revolution. If I'm working in a factory, I'm working, gosh, even by the turn of the century, I'm working five and a half, ten hour days. That's, that's a lot of work, right? What time do I have left over for revolution? Yeah? I thought that um, Marx had some preconditions before like, the revolution was occurring. One of them was like industrialization. And that had never actually occurred. That's good. It was supposed to happen after the Industrial Revolution. It was supposed to be a reaction to that. So it was going to occur in some highly industrialized country. And for that reason, it was thought that Germany or Britain or the United States would be the main places to watch. But of course, that didn't happen at all. Now, part of the reason, he says, is that, well, hmm, yeah, the lower classes by themselves are not likely to get there. And so he says, you do have to add something to Marxism, namely, the thought that somebody has to do this, <laughs> okay? It's not gonna happen automatically. Marx was a determinist. He thought that everything happened according to purely deterministic laws. Everything was necessitated by economic laws. And so the revolution would just come about as the economic system unfolded. But Lenin said, well, that doesn't seem to be happening. <laughs> the problem with his theory is there's no place for human freedom. At some point, someone has to decide to actually start the revolution, to participate in it, and so on. And so he says, look, people have to be free. There must be a power of the will. If you want to think of it this way, Lenin, like many other people later in the 20th century, adds an element of Nietzsche to Marx. He says, Marx is, I'm absolutely orthodox Marx because he requires no revision of any kind. Oh, but he does need some heavy spicing of the will, <laughs> of human freedom. Because in fact, the revolution isn't going to come about automatically. Somebody has to decide and through an act of will, bring it about. And so he says classes, like the bourgeoisie, the proletariat, and so on, they are led by parties. And parties are led by individuals who are called leaders. This is the ABC. The will of a class is sometimes fulfilled by a dictator. So he's saying, look, here's what Marx left out. He left out leadership. He left out decision. He left out freedom. He left out will. He left out the fact that somebody's going to have to decide to do this. And in fact, it's a highly dangerous thing to do. It's an unprecedented thing to do. And so his point is, look, it's going to require, at some point, a real act of will, a real act of leadership. And that means somebody has to take, it, to take charge of a class and become a leader. Okay, they have to do it through the power of will, and that is going to make them a dictator, because it's going to come about through their will. And indeed, Lenin put himself at the center of the revolution. Um, and then when he dies in 1924, there's a serious vacuum, which we'll consider later. There are all sorts of stamps that were issued throughout the history of the Soviet Union in his honor. This is one of them. Now, in what is to be done, he calls for a team of vanguard fighters, a revolutionary elite. They are to be a small, secret, disciplined elite who will create proletarian consciousness. Now, what does that mean? Well, think about the conditions of the proletariat by the turn of the century, for example. They had earlier been in these very crowded, polluted, unpleasant, unsanitary cities working incredibly long hours. But by 1900, and certainly by 1914, their condition has improved greatly. Real wages are up by, well, but pretty much have doubled. There are all sorts of consumer products, consumer goods. In short, the proletarians are saying, well, life isn't great, but it's a lot better than it was. <laughs> okay? And he says, yeah, you've got to create what he calls proletarian consciousness. In other words, you have to convince them that their interests are served by the revolution. Well, it's going to require a small, secret, highly disciplined elite who will do that. 
At this point, certain Marxists got off the boat. Rosa Luxemburg, for example, was a Marxist theorist who at this point said, this is a recipe for disaster. This is going to lead, to lead not to the revolution as Marx envisioned it, but to a military ultra-centralism. After all, you've got certain people who take over, they concentrate all power in themselves, they do it in the name of the proletariat, but now once they succeed, are they going to voluntarily give up power and say, okay, you guys take over? No. And so Rosa Luxemburg said, this is going to lead to basically a few people establishing a military dictatorship. It is not gonna serve the interests of the proletariat. Well, for that reason, she wasn't a revolutionary. Lenin went on and did it anyway. Here you see him pointing the way. <laughs> so there is another divergence from Marx. I've already talked about this, really. He recognizes, look, the revolution is not going to happen by itself. The history of all countries shows the working class, exclusively by its own effort, is able to develop only trade union consciousness. In other words, people working in the factories, people working on farms and so on, they're going to maybe band together in the unions, but what will the unions seek? Will they seek revolution? No, they'll seek to improve the conditions in the factories. They'll seek higher pay, better and safer working conditions, and so on. And so they're not going to seek revolution. The people will be concerned with their own immediate welfare. And so this is what Marx envisioned isn't really going to happen. So Lenin calls for an organization of revolutionaries. He says we want an organization of revolutionaries as an essential factor in making the political revolution. We've got to have this team of revol revolutionary vanguard fighters, and they're the ones who are going to bring this about. They've got to consist, first and foremost, of people whose profession is that of revolutionary. Okay? They can't be people who were working in the factories and meet on Saturday evenings to plot the revolution. <laughs> this has to be their full-time job. Such an organization must not be too extensive and as secret as possible. So he gives some principles for a revolution. First of all, he says, no movement can be durable without a stable organization of leaders to maintain continuity. So you've got to have a small team who, that remain the same, who are in charge of things. Power has to be concentrated in a few hands, and those people have to stay on the job. You need an elite team, and that team has to have continuity. It has to have stability. Second thing, the more widely the masses are spontaneously drawn into the struggle, in other words, the more you succeed, the more you actually start getting people on your side to form the basis of the movement and participate in it, the more necessary it is to have such an organization and the more stable it must be. In other words, he's saying the more you are successful, the more you actually start getting people on your side and creating a movement, the more you really have to concentrate power in a few hands. And the idea, I think, is this. Suppose a group of us decide to plot the revolution. Well, we start meeting, let's say, I don't know, in some classroom at UT, after hours, <laughs> and we're plotting the revolution, right? Does it matter who's the leader as long as it's, let's say, a team of five or six of us? Not really, right? We're this group of five or six, as long as we're sort of continuous and so on. But now we start actually attracting a large following. Well, it's really important now that we establish some structure. Any division within our unit is going to be reflected in a division of the movement overall. So it's very important that it be that, A, we maintain our stability and our power. And secondly, that even within our group, we concentrate power in a few hands. So as you start building a mass movement, and here is uh, a crowd in the Russian Revolution in 1917. Notice armed with very long sticks. <laughs> they didn't have rifles. They just carried these very long sticks. Um, Anyway, third, the organization must consist chiefly of persons engaged in revolutionary activities as a profession. Now, why is that so important? After all, if we've got a few of us who are voting full-time effort to this, wouldn't it be just as good to have a larger group who are each working part-time at it? Wouldn't it be enough to have everybody doing this after hours if we have a large enough group to do the work? He thinks no. Now, why not? It wouldn't be pleasant. Pleasant. Yeah. If, uh, if whatever happens in the inner circle reflects outwardly like that, like, like a diffusion type thing, if, if like the people in the inner circle aren't fully committed, then why should the people who follow them be? Ooh, good. If the people in the inner circle aren't fully committed, why should others be? So think about that. We want people who are fully committed to this. Suppose you're working part-time at this and part-time doing something else. Okay? <coughs> what is your chance of success? What is your first priority? You can say the first priority is the revolution, but there are all sorts of other things that might get in the way, right? 
Oh, my first priority is the revolution. But wait, I have an exam tomorrow. I can't come to the meeting. <laughs> or, look, it's my girlfriend's birthday. Or, you know, blah, 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 blah. There are going to be all sorts of excuses. And so his point is, look, you've got to be dedicated to this completely. You've got to put it as the top priority. To put this in a very different context, suppose you're trying to start up a business. A lot of people have said, what are your chances of success? They improve dramatically if you quit everything else you're doing and you work full time on that. Suppose you're working at another job and thinking, well, I don't know if this thing on the side is going to work out or not, so I'll just work on it after hours and on Saturdays. Your chances of success are greatly diminished. And so, it's in effect, he's saying that. Look, you're trying to start a revolution here. <laughs> That's a full-time job. It's something you have to be completely committed to. You can't be sort of committed to it, but in fact, allow other things to take priority over it. Finally, he's saying, in a country with an autocratic government, the more we restrict the membership of this organization to persons who are engaged in revolutionary activities as a profession, and who have been professionally trained in the art of combating the political police, the more difficult it will be to catch the organization. So in its early stages, it's important that it be secret. The powers, and especially in an autocratic country, in other words, a country like Russia, which is not devoted to freedom of speech and assembly and the press and so on, he realizes, look, the powers that be are going to try to stamp this group out. Well, if you have lots of people, lots of part-timers, it's going to be pretty easy to catch them. It's going to be pretty easy to break the organization. You need people who are completely dedicated so that you can remain secret. Finally, you have to be absolutely ruthless. He says in order to rid itself of an unworthy member, an organization of genuine revolutionaries recoils from nothing. So somebody has been coming to the meetings and has been causing trouble, disagreeing with the rest of the group, seems not to have the spirit of the revolution. What do you do? Kill them. Kill them. Exactly. Now, in most groups, it's not like that. Suppose you're in a seventh grade class, and there's this one kid in the class who's a real pain in the butt, annoys everybody. You beat him up. Well, some, some of you are maybe let at us at heart. Um, but no, I mean, ordinarily, one would think you pursue other ways of doing it. You don't just kill him. Or suppose there's somebody in your family nobody likes, right? The sister-in-law, who everybody agrees is a pain in the butt. You don't just kill her. Well, I hope. <laughs> um, but in this case, he's saying, look, you've got to recoil at nothing. Now again, part-timers, are they likely to do this? Hey, we've been meeting on Saturdays, and you know Joe keeps coming to the meetings and causing trouble, nobody likes him. Well, are you likely to say, let's kill him? Hey, no, I see him at work every, you know, every Monday, I'm not going to kill him. But in this case, no, you've got to recoil at nothing. You have to be willing to do anything for the sake of the revolution. So here in a nutshell are his goals. Destroy all power outside the party. So you've got power in the country distributed over all sorts of people holding all, all sorts of offices, some in government, some in private industry, and so on and so forth. You have to eliminate all that power, concentrate it in the hands of the party. Then, <laughs> once you've concentrated all power in the hands of the party, you've got to destroy all opposition within the party. There are people who disagree with you, get rid of them, kill them. And then concentrate all the party's power within the small elite, and finally, in yourself. So that's Lenin's goal. Nothing outside the party, and then within the party, no disagreement with the elite. Within the elite, no disagreement with Lenin, all power in the hands of Lenin. That's the ideology, okay? And his thought is that only that can actually succeed in bringing about the revolution and maintaining the goal and achieving it. So that's the strategy, yeah? What's Lenin think about Lenin? Did he agree with Marinetti or? <laughs> that's an interesting question. I don't remember ever reading anything about women in Lenin. Now, it's interesting that, in general, Marxists did not have that sort of attitude. For example, Rosa Luxemburg was a respected Marxist theorist. Um, on the other hand, I try to think of the people who were Lenin's lieutenants, and they're all men. There are no women in the power structure. And that remains true for a long time, actually. So he didn't write anything that affirms this. Um, on the other hand, I can't think of him ever putting any kind of power in the hands of a woman, so I suspect he wasn't that unsympathetic, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Well, here he is. You can see him addressing a large crowd, and there are a few other people up there with him, but in all of these scenes, he's there by himself. He's, there might be other people around, but he's the one speaking. He's the one waving his hat to the crowd. He's the one the revolution is centering around. Here he is in another photograph. 
Everybody else is down there, he's up on a plant. Right? It's Lenin, Uber, Alles. <laughs> Didn't they crop Trotsky out of Stalin? Oh yeah, we'll get to that story when we talk about the rise of Stalin. But yes, uh, initially it's Lenin and a small team of people like Trotsky and Bukharin and a variety of others. Um, <laughs> one by one they get thrown out of power, as we'll see. Um, and it's not by Lenin, it's <laughs> by Stalin. And really, I want you, actually, this isn't our topic for today, but I want you to think about this for when we get to Stalin. Imagine that you're one of the lieutenants of somebody like Lenin. You are one of the trusted figures, but you know he, I mean, not too long after the revolution, he has a stroke. He's incapacitated, and shortly thereafter, he dies. So there's a team of, let's say, five of you who are his most trusted lieutenants. You want to be the one who takes over Lenin's role. How do you do it? Well, the, the most obvious answer is kill all the rest. But actually, that doesn't occur to Stalin for quite some time. Hitler teaches Stalin that. Okay, that eventually, yeah, you can just kill him. It takes him a long time to realize it. And so at first, there's all this intrigue. So I want you to imagine that, you know, there's one girl in the sorority who is the unquestioned leader, and then she graduates. And there are like five of you who were in line to be the next leader of the sorority. How do you get to be the one, right? <laughs> Actually, that's what it's like. That's what it's most like. And I don't mean to, t I'm, I'm thinking of the movie Mean Girls here. Okay? <laughs> so I don't mean to be sexist in my choice of, you know, if, it's, if it'll make you happy, think of a fraternity, whatever. The idea is, it's just like, okay, you've got these people who are all sort of second in command, jointly sharing that, and now the person who was in command is gone. How do you get to be the one? That's Stalin's problem, and he solves it in intriguing and demoralizing ways. Yeah. In any case, <laughs> we can see here these images of Lemon as being the leader. Okay, so what does he do once he actually sees his power? First of all, closes all the newspapers, okay? There will be no information outside the party. Secondly, elections in every organization. That is to say, he wants people to vote. And he calls these Soviets, hence Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. There are all these little Soviets, so there is the appearance of democracy. And he can say, what do you mean, democracy? Hey, every single organization here is democratic, but it's because the real power is in the hands of the elite who tell the leaders of these Soviets who were elected what to do. He institutes house searches, seizing jewelry, seizing fur coats. And that's partly a sign of luxury, but think about a fur coat in Russia. That's not just a luxury. He seizes all schools, all banks, all factories. The party takes them over. He establishes revolutionary courts, basically gets rid of the standing Tsar's legal system and substitutes one of his own. He prohibits interest, dividends, withdrawals. He's trying to get rid of the power of the bankers, the financiers, the big business people. He is trying to basically guarantee that the party is in control of all financing, as well as all schools, all factories, all luxury goods, all organizations of any kind, all information. So here is a patrol from 1917 that goes out into the streets of Moscow and enforces the will of the party. After all, how are you going to do this? You've got to seize these things, these institutions, take them over. And so patrols like this of dedicated party members would roam the streets, taking over schools, taking over factories, searching your house, and so on. Um, have you ever seen the movie Dr. Zhivago? Yeah. You see an image of this kind of thing as uh, the, the main character there has his house taken over, other people housed there, um, all goods are taken away, and so on. Basically, these people take command in a kind of rough and ready way in the streets. The use of terror is not a temporary thing, and it's not an accident. Lenin says, in principle, we have never renounced terror and can never renounce it. We'll ask the man, where do you stand on the question of the revolution? Are you for it or against it? If he's against it, we'll stand him up against a wall. And what does that mean? Shoot him. Shoot him. That's right. That doesn't mean stand him up against a wall and say, bad boy. Stand in the corner. <laughs> that means shoot him. Now, he creates a secret police force. It was not officially acknowledged for 10 years, but it takes, uh, it becomes present as soon as he takes over power. It's called the Cheka, initially. And within three years, it had a quarter of a million full-time agents. So the Cheka becomes a significant power and begins carrying out his program of terror. Here you see victims of the terror just piled. Those are piles of bodies in a prison camp. So a system of prison camps is also almost immediately erected. Within a year, 
They are averaging 1,000 executions a month. Here are the bodies of people executed. You can notice some of them are children. They're executed not for any ordinary crimes, but for political crimes. He said they're to be arrested, they're to be tried, sentenced, and punished. There are absolutely no checks on power. Remember the law was concerned about impartial judgment. He said, look, I don't want the very people who are affected by a crime to be the ones who are in charge of deciding who's guilty and punishing them. But here, there is no such check. There's no independence, there's no impartiality. Yeah? What could a child possibly do in, in reference to a political crime if they're ignorant based Okay, good. You're a child. What could you possibly do to be guilty of a political crime? It could be your parents who are really guilty. But what could make you, what could make anybody guilty? Here's what Lenin actually says. He says, I want to seek out, arrest, and shoot immediately enemies, idlers, bribe takers, speculators, prostitutes, ex-officers, work shirkers, hoarders, and so on. There is not a minute to be wasted. So what can you or your family do to become a victim? Well, you could be an enemy of the revolution, i.e. somebody who is not supportive of the party. You could be an idler. In other words, they tell you to go work in the factory and you don't show up. They kill you. <laughs> Bribe takers. Speculators. Wait, you invested money in that company? You, you own stock? You're a prostitute? You're an ex-military officer. You claim to be on the side of the revolution, but wait, you were a lieutenant in the Tsar's army? You're a work shirker. You show up at the factory, but you don't work very hard. Bam. Hoarder, we've caught you hiding a fur coat in the back of your closet, trying to keep it away from the agents of the revolution. Bam. Okay. And entire families would be killed. Now, this is the way it starts. It actually gets worse. Within weeks, they were operating a system of concentration and labor camps. By 1920, there were over 50,000 executions a year taking place in the Soviet Union. And here becomes the ideology. That's the person who was put in charge of this. Here he's identified as Peters. That was one of his uh, aliases. His real name was Latsis. He was the head of the Czech. And he says, without mercy, without sparing, we will kill our enemies in the scores of hundreds. Let them be thousands. Let them drown themselves in their own blood. Let there be floods of blood of the bourgeois. And that tells us something about what really people are held to be guilty of. It's not that individually you have to do anything. It starts out that way. Ah, individually, you opposed the revolution, or you were trying to hoard some luxury goods, or you were refusing to show up at the factory. But Lenin, by January of 1918, is saying, we've got to purge the Russian land of all kinds of harmful <coughs> insects. The revolutionary courts must shoot. And so Solzhenitsyn, later, in the Gulag Archipelago, lists some of the targets. Homeowners, high school teachers, priests, monks, nuns, pacifists, trade union officials. So how does a child end up getting killed? They're of the wrong class. Their parents own a home. Okay? The whole family's killed. Their parent is a high school teacher. Well, unlikely <laughs> to be a child of a priest or a nun, but, but you know, their, their parents are pacifists, etc. Or the, the dad was a trade union official, uh, etc. And so here are here's a wagon filled with bodies being transported. Lotsa said that Cheka doesn't judge the enemy. It strikes him. We are not carrying out war against individuals. We are exterminating the bourgeoisie as a class. We are not looking for evidence or witnesses. The first question we ask is, to what class does he belong? What are his origins, upbringing, education, or profession? These questions define the fate of the accused. This is the essence of the Red Terror. And so you're, what you see happening here later on gets expressed in maybe its most extreme form in Cambodia when it's taken over by Pol Pot. There, they take children and try to determine their social class. Well, how do you know what social class a child is? Especially if the child has been separated from parents, if whole families have been split as they are forced into the countryside. You've got this, let's say, two-year-old. What social class is the two-year-old? I mean, an obvious question is, who cares? It's a two-year-old. <laughs> but they cared. Is this a bourgeois two-year-old or a proletarian child? How would you find out? Maybe just do, maybe they just shoot the kid. Maybe they do. I mean, here's one test that develops. Do you have eyeglasses? That's a sign that, A, your parents were wealthy enough to get you eyeglasses, and B, you actually might be able to read. Assume, I mean, here, it's not two years old, but a little later. So anybody with eyeglasses would be shot. Or here's another test they used in Cambodia. Give the child a hot bowl of rice. The children from the lower class wouldn't have been able to afford a spoon. 
they would know to blow on the rice before putting their hands in. The children of the upper class who were used to eating rice with a spoon would tend to put their fingers into the rice and burn themselves. So if the child went, now these are hungry children, by the way, <laughs> hungry two-year-olds. You put rice in front of them, I'm amazed that any of them would wait. But if the child reached in and went, ow, bash his head with a shovel. Okay? And so that's the kind of thing that's going on here. Not in quite as extreme a form as it took place later in Cambodia, but that's the general idea. What did you do? You didn't have to do anything. <laughs> you're just the wrong kind of person. And so your origins, your upbringing, gosh, I would be, well, my origins, I'm okay. My family was poor. <laughs> upbringing, well, actually, I went to some pretty good schools, and I do have classes, and I learned to read. Educated, I have a PhD. Double <laughs> profession. I'm a professor, right? Well, if a high school teacher is to be killed, imagine what a university professor, you know, has that happened to him? So I'd be executable many times over. <laughs> now, here's a, here they're happily holding up, right? The body of this guy who's been murdered. His crime, he was an ex-army officer. There were other forms of barbarism. The murder of the royal family on July 16th, 1918. And then also the murder of British naval attaché, Captain Crombie at the British Embassy. Churchill, at the time, was the head of the Navy Department in Britain. He urged that Lenin and Trotsky be captured and shot for these crimes. But the Western powers were tired of war. They couldn't agree to do that. They were kind of like, wait, we've just fought this war for four years, killing large percentages of our population. And you want us to fight a war against our former ally? because he killed the royal family. Oh, and even our, he attack, they attacked our embassy and killed him. Look, no, we, we're tired of war. We don't want to do it. Well, from one point of view, what did Lenin accomplish through all of this? He replaced one ruling class with another, okay, which later got dubbed the new class by Milovan Dilas, who was pictured there. He was a Yugoslavian theorist who said, look, what happens in this kind of situation is, yes, there's an old class, the bourgeoisie, that is eliminated and pushed aside, but somebody's got to run things, right? Here, how will this work out? Okay, everybody show up at the factory and do whatever you want. Are they going to succeed in making anything? Or suppose at the university we just say, hey, just show up whenever you want, do whatever you want. So a random assortment of people show up in this room and they say, hey, what are we going to do? <laughs> Right? Somebody's got to organize things. Somebody's got to say, okay, here will be the classes, here's when they meet, and so on. Those decisions have to be made by somebody. Somebody has to actually organize things. And so this vanguard elite really becomes a ruling class of bureaucrats and party functionaries, people who actually organize society and make things happen. But from the point of view of the proletarian, okay, great. Um, <laughs> meet the new boss, same as the old boss. How is that going to actually help the proletarians? In fact, Robert Michaels, just, a, just before the First World War and the Russian Revolution, came up with what he called the Iron Law of Oligarchy. He said all forms of organization eventually turn into oligarchies. Who says organization says oligarchy? Why? Because in any kind of organization, however small or however large, some people have to organize it. Some people have to decide what's going to be done. Somebody has to order the parts. Somebody has to schedule the runs at the factory. Somebody has to decide which classes will be offered and when they will meet, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody's got to do this. And so inevitably, he says, whenever you organize anything, some people are going to end up being in charge. They have to be, or the organization will be completely disorganized and dysfunctional. Well, this new class in Russia grew to perhaps 15 million people. Nevertheless, control was maintained by a very small elite. It was handpicked by Lenin. And here you see Lenin losing at chess. At <laughs> chess, sorry. And this guy makes a move and he is very unhappy. <laughs> so, no, I don't think he killed him, but... Yeah, anyway, I find that an amazing photograph. Well, how did the Western press react to all of this? They, in general, thought this was wonderful. The reports on the Russian Revolution were glowing. Lincoln Steffens, for example, in 1919, visited Russia, came back saying, I've been over into the future, and it works. All roads in our day lead to Moscow. Now, what could he possibly have seen? There were some Potemkin villages set up to show visitors how ideal things were after the revolution. On the other hand, it's hard to imagine that Lincoln Steffens could have seen much of anything that would justify this sort of praise. Was he lying? Was he somehow deceived? What was going on here? Here, in fact, what was taking place. Petrograd, before that known as St. Petersburg, 
In the three years between 1917 and 1920, lost 72% of its population. This is central St. Petersburg in 1919, just two years after the revolution. It was not destroyed during the First World War. This is the result of the revolution. Almost three out of every four res residents fled. Here are the streets of a part of St. Petersburg that was intact. That's the public library. Before the war, this would have been crowded. This was the main, and in fact, the capital city. This would have been jammed with people. Now, well, there are some people, but not very many. The city is virtually empty. The economy crashed. Three million people died of starvation in the winter of 1921 to 1922 alone. And here you can see images of starving children. Here are beggars in the streets of St. Petersburg. Here is a horse dying of starvation in the middle of the street. If you look at the economy more broadly, iron production after the revolution was 2% of what it had been before the revolution. Okay, so 98% of iron production just gone after the Russian Revolution. What about manufactured goods? Well, 13% of what it had been before the revolution. And so the economy was in tatters. <clears throat> well, this points to something I call the socialist dilemma. The revolution resulted in disaster, in famine, in the collapse of industry. In 1921, he realized that and announced what he called the new economic program. It allowed ownership, free exchange for peasant farmers to end the famine. And it seemed to start to work. But the experiment really never got a chance. By 1924, he was dead and Stalin took over, ending the experiment. Here's what I mean by the socialist dilemma. Market forces tend to reassert themselves. So you've got to either allow a resurgence of the free market, or you've got to use force to stop that from happening at a terrible economic and human cost. And that's exactly the dilemma that Lenin faced, that Stalin faces later. Now the question I had hoped to discuss, but I have to leave you with, is just Market forces do tend to reassert themselves. Why? Well, we'll consider that question when we return to Russia's history later. <clears throat>